afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for um, joining us this afternoon. So I want to talk today about um, impact evaluation and evidence in conservation and how we as a sector need to stop relying on evidence and start being really intentional about the evidence that we use to make decisions, the ways in which we use that evidence and the ways that evidence in its own biases and limitations can change the decisions that we make and our behaviours and motivations. And I'm going to focus in on impact evaluation today, but some of the things that I'm talking about uh, are also present in other types of monitoring evaluation. So the impact of conservation is widely debated. For any intervention that you care to think about, marine protected areas, protected areas, payments-free fisheries services, certification of standards, there is a debate raging in the literature about their impacts. That debate will range from concerns about their ecological impact through to concerns about their social impact. And you'll usually find a vocal group of people saying, these are great, there's a win-win for conservation and poverty, we should do this everywhere, all the time, in every possible place. And then you'll find an equally vocal group of people on the other side of the debate saying, these are terrible, awful idea, don't do this anywhere, ever, under any circumstances. And often the, the problem with this debate is that they're really long running. Some of the debates about protected areas have been running for about 30 years now. And there's relatively little sign of us coming to a resolution because we rely on anecdotal evidence largely. It's case studies um, that have differing levels of documentation. People have their own touchstones that they all like to uh, go back to. Their particular case studies that speak to their particular argument. And that becomes really problematic for an organization like WWF. Because not only are we part of that debate, but we're trying to make decisions based on the consensus of that debate. And that means that for the most part, and you know, this isn't true everywhere, a lot of decisions in conservation are effectively a shot in the dark. And Irene Agarwal and Kent Bedford wrote an amazing working paper back in 2006 that basically says, we really don't know what we're doing. We've, we've got called guesswork and hunches, and we really need to fix this. And you know, a decade later, we've made some progress, but we're not anywhere near where we need to be. Um, and so impact evaluation has emerged as one potential mechanism for building credible evidence base in conservation. It's something that we've adopted from other sectors, health, public health, uh, education um, and social development and it offers a whole lot of promise and potential but a whole lot of pitfalls too and so what I'd like to do today is talk you through some of that promise and potential and highlight some of the pitfalls and think about how we might go about navigating that for conservation. So impact evaluation comes in many forms but um, the type of impact evaluation that people are most excited about in conservation is called quasi-experimental impact evaluation. And what this allows us to do through a series of statistical techniques is estimate the causal effect, i.e. the impact that we can attribute back to the intervention that we're interested in, of an intervention that's not placed randomly on a landscape or a seascape. So think about this as a reverse engineered random controlled trial. So in medicine, when we want to test the effectiveness of a drug, we assign people at random to a treatment group and it ran to a control group. And the randomization means that their characteristics are going to be roughly the same. And so any difference in outcomes that we see is due to the drug. Now, randomization is possible in a small number of cases in conservation, but for the most part, randomizing conservation interventions would be a terrible idea. Randomizing where we put marine protected areas on the ocean is not the best way to uh, conserve biodiversity. So we need to do something else. We need to use those rules of thumb and decisions that we made about where to put an MPA to also find ourselves a control group. And that is effectively what a quasi-experiment is doing. It's reverse engineering the equivalent of a randomized controlled trial at large in the world. And it does this by controlling for the factors that affect participation. So where we put a marine protected area versus here versus there. Um, and also the factors that might influence outcomes. 
And it does this based on what's known as the Neyman Rubin causal model. And impact evaluation is a literature unto itself, it has a language unto itself. And most of that masks what is actually a surprisingly simple and elegant idea. That impact is simply the change that you see in the site that received your treatment, minus the change in the site that didn't. And so that seems like a really simple thing <coughs> to achieve. But there's a couple of really tricky assumptions that we have to handle when we do quasi-experiments. And the first one is called unconfoundedness. And this basically means that we are able to observe all of those factors that influence whether or not we participate in, say, a marine protected area, and that influence the outcome that we're interested in. And the second assumption is called overlap. And that basically says that given the things that we can observe about all of these different sites, if you have similar characteristics, you have an equal chance of either being protected or non-protected in a conservation intervention or out of one. At first glance, these seem pretty simple. Um, but unfortunately, actually getting a handle on these and meeting these assumptions is a relatively tricky task, and it only works in a relatively small number of conservation interventions. And so what we're effectively trying to do in controlling for these, uh, or meeting these assumptions, is controlling for what we call observable bias. So those factors that control participation and outcomes. So if you think about a forested landscape, what we know from um, scientific studies is that deforestation rates are higher um, if you're close to the road. They are higher at low elevation. They're higher when you're close to the forest edge. And they're higher when you're close to a market. And it turns out that these are also the factors that influence where we put protected areas. Surprise, surprise, we tend to put protected areas in places that are easy to conserve. And so protected areas tend to be far from roads, at higher elevations and on steep slopes, uh, far from the forest edge, and far from the nearest market. So we can use this information when we know that the protected areas have these characteristics, we can use these factors to go search across the landscape and look for similar controls, sites that could have been protected but just weren't by chance. The second thing that we're trying to control for um, when we design um, a quasi-experiment or any kind of impact evaluation is the interaction effect. So the idea that no conservation intervention is an island. So they are affected by and have effects upon the landscape and or the seascape in which they're situated. And this interaction effect can go both ways. Um, so for example, you can see a spillover effect, and I'm not quite sure why the ocean is purple here, but we're just going to roll with it. Uh, so for example, in a marine protected area, when we establish an MPA, what happens, it, and we establish a no-take zone in there, we kick the big boats out. And you know, privilege local users um, or small uh, subsistence fishers in the take of the fish from the MPA. Now what can happen is Inside the no-take zone, we get more fish, bigger fish, they spill over, and then the spillover effect happens outside the MPA too. So basically, we can see the effect of the MPA outside. It's sort of an increase outside the MPA. The reverse is true too, and this is something we see in MPAs a lot. You establish the MPA, you establish your no-take zone, and then your fishers move out, but they only move out so far, and then they start fishing up and down the MPA boundary. And this means that because you've displaced the threat, you'll see lower populations of fish immediately outside the MPA. So these interaction effects mean that we can't just use areas immediately adjacent to a conservation intervention as our control sites. It would be really convenient, but the reality is that these kinds of impacts, either ecological or social, tend to spill outside the defined boundary. So this is another big area where we have to do some clever thinking when doing an impact evaluation. Now, quasi-experimental um, impact evaluation was built in a certain set of fields. So medicine, public health were where these methods were pioneered. 
And they tend to have certain sets of conditions that we don't necessarily see that often in conservation. So, um, for example, running these kinds of quasi experiments requires a really good knowledge of the processes that affect participation and outcomes. They require data on those things. They, we need clearly bounded interventions in both time and space so that we can control for interaction effects and those, you know, who is inside the intervention and who is outside. And we need to understand the spatial extent of the likely interaction effects. Now, this list of criteria looks starkly different to what we find in the real world of conservation. In the real world, we have limited or contested knowledge about why we place protected areas where we do and what affects their outcomes. Data is at best patchy, incomplete, in some places it's completely absent. We have unclear boundaries, or we specifically design our interventions to diffuse and spread across our landscape. And we really don't have a clear understanding of interaction effects. Marine protected areas and the spillover from them are probably the best understood of any that we've discovered at this point. So this poses some fairly serious challenges for using these techniques in conservation. And what it generates is a huge array of disconnects. Now, I don't want you to read all of the text on this slide, but this is the first chunk of what has turned into, I think it's something like a 30-page Word document detailing all of the ways in which conservation does not really match up to impact evaluation theory. And the point of showing you this is that when we do an impact evaluation and when we apply this technique in conservation, whether we make it explicit or it's implicit, we are making a series of judgments that lead to trade-offs. And they may be that we only apply impact evaluation in those places where the conditions are right, but that means we have a skewed evidence base that only tells us something about those interventions that are easy to evaluate. Or we apply these techniques in a more kind of loosey-goosey fashion in places where they're not so well suited, but then we bias our evidence base in a different way because our estimates may be inaccurate. This kind of stuff isn't really debated in the literature that much, and it's a big problem. And it's one that the conservation sector is gonna need to tackle and come up with a collective understanding of when these techniques are appropriate and when they're not. So in all that's to follow, please keep in the back of your mind, I'm not advocating for this to be used everywhere. And I don't have an answer to any of these, um, when should we use it, when should we not use it, things. But I'd like to talk to you about um, a case study um, of doing an impact evaluation of marine protected areas. And we were interested in answering some really fundamental questions about MPAs. Um, what are the social and ecological impacts? How do they vary across social and ecological within social? So for example, do you see economic well-being increasing but health decreasing? How do they vary across geographies and space and time? Then we get into questions about synergies and equity and trade-offs and whose trade-offs? How does governance shape MPA impacts? And all of these questions are ultimately of interest because organizations like WWF want to understand how to do this. Design MPAs to maximize their positive impacts. So the work that we've been doing and that I'm gonna talk you through um, follows this basic structure. So we monitor both before and after the intervention in both MPAs and similar controls. And we account for the bias in MPA location and the biases that might arise from MPA outcomes. And we do this uh, in, at two levels. So this is one of the way, ways we get around having patchy and incomplete data. Because we don't have really good data on individual households uh, in the places where we work, we use what we call course matching to tell us where likely control settlements might be we go out and we blanket survey all of them. And then we use that data at baseline to help us find those really strong matches. Um, and then through time, we monitor the difference in what we see in the NPA versus what we see in the control. So it's called a difference in difference. 
And so we've been working uh, for the past five years or so in a series of MPAs in the Bird's Head and more recently in the Sundaban Seascapes. Um, now, over the past decade or so, the Bird's Head has been the focus of some of the biggest marine conservation investment in history. Uh, about $60 million has been poured into this seascape in that time. Um, and so the donors involved in this case were particularly interested in understanding their return on investment. And in the neighboring Sundabanda seascape, we have two sites, Flores Timor and Awol, where we have baseline data. And over the next few months, we'll be working to collect baseline data in those three sites shown with stars. So when we come to control for observable bias, we do it definitely for social and ecological. And I'm just going to focus on social um, from here on out. Uh, but we are particularly interested, uh, based on theory and empirical evidence, about distance to market, the major livelihood of fisher, of community members, particularly whether they're fishers or non-fishers primarily, the political jurisdiction, uh, which is a proxy for, for likelihood of being established. So some political leaders are conservation-minded, some are not. Um, and also some sense of being a proxy for variable management capacity. And then uh, social structure, which gives us a really coarse, and we do admit that this is really, really coarse, uh, proxy for the probability of collective action in a community and social cohesion. So then what we do once we've um, identified those controlled settlements or those settlements where we think control households might be resident, we go and we do a series of household surveys and we collect information on a whole variety of things, including the uh, covariates that you can see on the y-axis here. And these are the things that we're controlling for when we're matching up households inside the MPA with households outside. And what you're looking at here is the way that we judge whether the construction of our quasi experiment has been a success. And it's called covariate balance. So on the x-axis, you've got absolute standardized mean difference. If you see the points line up on zero, that means that across the sample, MPA and control samples are identical in their characteristics. The further they get away, um, the larger and larger the differences. And the rule of thumb, and it is only a rule of thumb, is that if your differences are below 5%, you have a good enough design to withstand and make a causal inference. And so what we find is um, when you look at the pre-match characteristics, so before our matching procedures versus after we've done our matching, for the most part, um, the matching not only reduces the differences that we see in households inside the MPA versus outside, but it also pulls it to within the bounds where we can make causal inference. There is one pesky uh, variable here, which not only moves in the wrong direction, but stays uh, way beyond uh, the limits of where it should be for a quasi experiment, but we can control for this later in our models. Um, and this is because um, in one of the communities in Mazol, there is, um, in one of the MPAs where we work, there is a pearl farm the Pearl Farm has a relatively skilled workforce, and so what you're looking at there is people, as part of that skilled workforce, being slightly different to the rest of the community. And then we look at, uh, to understand MPA social impacts, we look at a broad range of indicators of human well-being. So we look at economic, health, political empowerment, education, and culture. Not all of these are intended impacts of the MPA, and that's deliberate because we wanted to capture both what we thought the MPAs might do and then the unexpected stuff too. So when we were designing our surveys, a lot of people pushed back on us and said, how on earth is it that you think an MPA is gonna influence X or Y? And we came back and said, you know what? It's much more important that we cast the net wide to catch the unintended stuff because the unintended stuff may be more important to the local community than the stuff we actually intended to do. And so to cut quite a long story short, so 
Uh, these graphs are the product of five years worth of surveys, almost 5,000 household surveys conducted by a local university partner, um, involved training uh, almost 100 enumerators, um, samples across 112 settlements, and so on and so on. We can boil down uh, what we found to this. And that is, surprise, surprise, that NPA social impacts are variable. We kind of knew this already, but it's nice to actually have it in uh, solid empirical evidence. Now we have data like this for all of the MPAs that we've been working in, but I'm just gonna focus on these two for now. So what you're looking at here is um, the net difference between MPA households and their similar controls through time. The orange line in the middle of the radar is the zero line. So there, there is no net difference between MPA households and control households through time. If that thick blue line pulls in uh, beneath the um, orange line, negative MPA impact. And we know that that's the effect of the MPA, that's not due to other factors. If it pulls out a long way towards the edge of the diagram, that is a positive impact of the MPA, and we can causally attribute that to the MPA, not other factors. And so what you see here is that impacts vary in a couple of different dimensions. They vary among different indicators and between sites. So there's quite a noticeable difference between Chenkawasi National Park and Maya Libet, with Maya Libet having a really strong effect on school enrollment rate. Um, now, these figures are interesting, but they only tell us part of the story, um, and almost the least interesting part. It's when we actually start to dig into the data and explore the different dynamics of MPA impacts that things start to get interesting. So here you're looking at baseline data only. And what, and what we can see here is that households are really variable. Um, households with medium wealth typically have a, maybe a boat without a, mo a motor, maybe a boat with a motor and a mobile phone. The poorest households in the community have none of those assets. The richest have several boats with inboard motors, TVs, generators, and so on. Now, when we look at uh, what's happening in um, Chandrawasi, what we see is that there has been a significant increase in uh, these household assets and their ownership. In Mylovit, we see a significant decrease. For food security, um, and this was one where we got a lot of pushback originally. And people said, really, MPAs influence food security? And this was a time before the whole MPAs food security thing became a thing. Um, and that really happened around us um, while this work was happening. But what we found at baseline was that, much to the surprise of many people in the seascape, was that households in the seascape are largely food insecure, which means they have worries and concerns about accessing safe, nutritious, and socially acceptable foods. The households in that yellow block there are classified as effectively starving. These are people who are not just concerned about not having enough to eat, they're experiencing hunger that is prolonged and profound. So this is a fairly serious issue for the seascape moving forward. And what we find is that one MPA seems to increase food security, and the other one seems to decrease it. Now, in the case of this particular impact, we may have a confounding factor. So quasi-experiments are not perfect, and they're vulnerable where you have an impact that is coincident with an MPA, but that only affects the MPA itself. And in this case, that impact was a large mudslide that took out the provincial town of the MPA it affected people's ability to access food. It dumped a whole lot of sewage into the sea and people became very fearful about eating fish because of the health implications. So this one, um, we're not, we're a little cautious about ascribing that one to the MPA. And what this, these different dynamics started to get us to think about was maybe the picture is far more complicated than we allow ourselves to think about um, or have thought about in the past. 
So often we talk about um, MPA and conservation social impacts as being cost versus benefit, positive versus negative. And we get into this really dichotomous debate as scientists and practitioners about what's going on and when. And by examining the dynamics between MPAs and controls, what we find is that actually you can get a whole array of different combinations of impacts, ranging from things going up in an MPA in absolute terms and going down in a control site in absolute terms to the opposite. But in between, you have these different kind of flavors of impact, things like buffer, buffering um, against broader change or exacerbating trends of broader change, magnifying increases or constraining them. And this began, we began to realize that actually MPA impacts, when we frame them as just positive, negative, we're doing ourselves as conservationists a disservice because we're not allowing for the complexity of the world changing around our interventions to play through how we talk about them. And so when we put the impacts from Chindrawasi and Maya Libet onto this typology, what we find is that very few, or in this case, none of the impacts conform to our original things go up in the MPA, they go down somewhere else. Nothing conforms to that extreme. Most impacts right now are neutral. This is only two years post MPA establishment. So in many cases, we wouldn't necessarily expect these impacts to have played out through the community yet. And when we, play, when we put the impacts from all of the other MPAs uh, that we're working in onto this framework, surprise, surprise, it kind of looks like a histogram. Most stuff clusters around neutral and then things spread out towards the end. We have still yet to find a case of pure benefit, still have yet to find a case of pure cost. So that brings a level of nuance to our thinking at least for us, maybe you guys were in a much more sophisticated place than we were, but this really changed how we thought about our work. Um, and as you can see here, you know, one particular dimension of human well-being can vary dramatically. Uh, in Chindrawasi, caveat of mudslide, it, you know, notwithstanding, food security seems to be exacerbated by NPA establishment. Whereas in a neighboring MPA, it seems to buffer changes. Now, one of the hidden challenges to impact evaluation is hidden bias. And this is something that it becomes a little Donald Drumsfeldian in some ways. It becomes this kind of space of unknown unknowns and known unknowns and all of that kind of stuff. But we have to assume in our design that all of the biases that affect where we put an MPA and its outcomes are accounted for in our model. If we cannot assume that, the whole thing falls apart. And there is no way to know whether that assumption holds, because if we knew about a bias, we would control for it. So what if there are biases that we don't know about, we don't know to control for, so we didn't control for them? It becomes really sort of metaphysical really quickly. Um, but there is a way that we can think about the implications of this kind of hidden or unobserved bias. And this is where we do a thought experiment. So we say, well, okay, assuming such bias exists, how big does it have to be to change the findings that we see? So what you're looking at here um, on the figure is exactly that. So Rosenbaum's gamma is a measure of the amount of bias you would have to introduce. And it's sort of is relative to um, the model itself. So one is equivalent to the model. Two would be you have to introduce twice the level of variation into the model in order to change the results. There is no clear rule of thumb for interpreting Rosenbaum's gamma. There is no this is okay, this is not okay. But generally people say, if it's substantially greater than one. And that, some people have interpreted as being 1.1, some people have interpreted that as being two, who knows? This is again, another place where impact evaluation becomes less of a science and more of a dark art. Um, and in this case, what you can see is that some of our p-values, 
are really quite sensitive to potential hidden bias. Doesn't mean the hidden bias exists, but it means that if it did, our results could change. Same thing for the confidence intervals around our treatment effect. So here we're thinking about how much bias would we have to introduce to shift our confidence intervals back to the point where the MPA has no net effect. So effectively giving the data a hard shove, and the x-axis is how hard do we have to push the data in order to change. And here, things are a little bit better. So we can be fairly confident in our treatment effects. Whether or not they're significant is less certain. But this is something that if you're looking at impact evaluations in the literature, if they don't have this included somewhere in their supplementary materials, if you're reviewing it, I would ask why. Um, because this is pretty important. And so, you know, our work in Indonesia um, has been a real learning curve for us and for others about how you implement one of these things on the ground in real time whilst a conservation intervention is evolving around you. So by evolving around us, I mean boundaries get redrawn and completely mess up our control sites. Uh, zoning plans change, things are delayed. This is just the real world that we have to deal with in an impact evaluation. And one of the things that we have learned is that there is no way that the impact evaluation can or should drive implementation. So we're on the receiving end of whatever changes come our way, um, and we just have to deal with that, which means things get messier than we would like. But through this work and through the work of others, there are some emerging sort of frontiers in impact evaluation around both the science that we do, how we practice conservation, and policy that as a community we're gonna have to address, and address pretty quickly. The impact evaluation train is leaving the station. It's rapidly becoming conservation's latest fad. Um, and that's great for building an evidence base, but it's also really bad if we do it wrong because it could have profound implications for how we do conservation in the future. If we do impact evaluation badly and come up with evidence that is biased or inaccurate, what does that do to how we do conservation? Maybe nothing, maybe no one listens to evidence anyway, or maybe it's fairly important. And so some of these frontiers are around the science, and some of these frontiers are around how we do business. And so I'm gonna walk through some of these um, with just a few quick examples um, to kind of get you thinking about some of these challenges. One of the big challenges of impact evaluation right now is interaction effects. Most papers use an arbitrary distance. They say we're going to not identify controls within 10 kilometers or 20 kilometers or 50 kilometers or whatever that is. Just an arbitrary catch all distance that tries to iron out any of those interaction effects. That's problematic because what people tend to do is just read the literature and say everyone uses a 10 kilometer buffer. Let's just use a 10 kilometer buffer. That might not be the case in the system that you're working in or trying to control for the particular impacts that you're interested in. This is some work that I did as part of my PhD where I was trying to think really carefully about interaction effects. This is like an incremental improvement on the arbitrary buffer. I'm not advocating that this is the path forward, um, but this is one way to think about it. And this uh, builds on the work of uh, Ruth DeFries and some of the geographers in conservation, who think about zones of influence around conservation. And so here, uh, what we did was identify some key interactions that we thought could influence the outcomes and, um, of an impact evaluation that sought to look at community conservancies in Kenya. So here in the center of the map, you've got uh, some black splotches, which are community um, managed conservancies. And so for each of those four characteristics, what we did was go trawl through the literature and try and find our best understanding of what an appropriate metric might be for controlling for this interaction effect. And it became incredibly arbitrary incredibly quickly, which is why I say this is an incremental improvement. The arbitrary nature of this is just hidden one layer down. 
But what, what I'm trying to demonstrate here is that um, if you look at the sort of beige outline, that is a far from regular shape. Um, and it's much, much bigger than 10 kilometers or 20 kilometers. And even this was a conservative estimate of the zone of influence around um, the protected areas or the community conservancies. Where we need to go is to get to the point of having evidence-based buffers. Now, this is something that is gonna be incredibly hard to fund as a piece of science because we're not actually asking about the impact of the conservation intervention we're asking about its zone of influence and the extent of it. It's not something that's immediately fundable in many ways. And the thing that with interaction effects that gets really tricky is once you actually start looking at them based on theory and evidence, is that they get bigger. And the bigger they get, the more observable bias that you start introducing back into your system because objects closer together in space tend to be more alike. And so here you have a demonstration of this. So this map is basically telling you the probability of being a community conservancy based on some observable characteristics. So this is what we use to build our quasi experiment. Red stuff is more similar to the conservancies. Blue stuff is less. And when you overlay the potential zone of influence onto this map, what it does is knock out about 75% of your potential control sites, which is really, really irritating um, as an evaluator and poses us some fairly serious logistical challenges because the scale on this map is, has disappeared, but um, you know those sites that are right down on the bottom right-hand corner are about 450 kilometers away from the conservancies. At that point, even though my model is telling me these are similar communities, I'm starting to question from a social perspective whether they really are. So we need to do some serious thinking about how we control for interaction effects and at what point we care more about observable bias versus interaction effects. Where's that balance? And there's no clear answer. The other big frontier from a scientific perspective is the idea that ecosystems and human systems vary through time, uh, which I think we all knew anyway. But from an impact evaluation standpoint, it's pretty tricky. And this is something you see a lot in impact evaluations that happen in the uh, terrestrial realm, where we have remote sensing data. The typical way of doing things is to pick a couple of years before protected area or conservation intervention establishment, and then look at the impact a few years later and do just sort of snapshots in time. The problem with that is that if your outcome is something that's variable through time, you've just taken one slice in time and said this is the impact. The impact is 5%, but maybe next year it's 10%. And this is a really good example of of this. So what you're looking at here is the Enhanced Vegetation Index, which is a measure of how much green stuff is sat on the landscape at any particular point in time. And so the dotted line at the bottom is our control sites. The lines at the top are various different management zones for the community conservancies in Kenya. And what, because the amount of green stuff on the landscape varies through time with rains and grazing patterns and so on, what you can see here is that if we had taken 2009, for example, when there was a really bad drought as the year in which we chose to just do our arbitrary slice, we would conclude that community conservancies are effective, but they're not as effective as they were in 2007 when it had rained a bunch more and there was more green stuff. And so thinking about these kinds of sort of temporal heterogeneity within the outcome variables is something that we really don't do very well yet. But we're going to have to, because otherwise we're going to start skewing our evidence base again. And then some um, thoughts about what, how conservation interventions affect, in particular, human well-being, but also um, 
could apply to ecological systems too. Um, and Paul Ferraro and a guy called Merlin Hanauer have done some really cool analysis on this in the past few years. So this frontier is advancing. But typically, impact evaluation treats your intervention as a black box. It simply draws a line around it and says, what's the impact of X? What it doesn't tell us is how that, in, that intervention is working. Now, for most decision makers in the world, you tell them that you know, a protected area is decreasing deforestation by 5% a year, they'll say, well, okay, that's great. How do I do that elsewhere? You'll get like the three second nod, that's great. The next question is how do I do that elsewhere? And being able to understand how effects occur is really where we need to get to. But the challenge with this is this requires very big sample sizes. It requires a lot of careful design to begin to tease apart these effects because otherwise you can really quickly wade into some very dangerous waters of multiple hypothesis testing and various other things. And that's just the science stuff. And in some ways, those are the frontiers that my, I am particularly interested in tackling through science. But we could tackle and solve all of those and not make one inch of difference about whether impact evaluation builds a credible evidence base in conservation. Because the big challenge is how do we get this stuff used? Um, and a lot of people are talking about mainstreaming impact evaluation. And uh, there's a great paper by Bayless et al. that talks about you know, some of the methodological things that we need to achieve to mainstream it. But I would argue methodological challenges are only one slice of the problem here. First of all, we don't even know what mainstreamed impact evaluation looks like. Does that mean we do impact evaluation everywhere for 10% projects, 5%? For all big new projects, all projects over a certain dollar amount? What does that mean? What is the acceptable standard of evidence for conservation decision making? At what point do we need this really credible evidence? And at what point is just our you know, best guess the best that we can and should do? And then, you know, once we've got those two, you know, easy questions solved, then we've got to think about, well, how do we make that happen? And what are the institutional incentives and barriers to that? And we've just started thinking about this at WWF because one of the roles that um, the unit that I work in is tasked with is actually mainstreaming impact evaluation for WWF. And we, we don't quite understand what that means yet. Um, and so we started thinking about what are the institutional incentives of the different actors in the conservation space around impact evaluation. So broadly, there are four groups. Uh, you've got academics who are motivated by trying to understand systems and advance theory. You've got NGOs who want to save the world. You've got investors who want to understand their return on investment. And you've got policymakers who hopefully want to make evidence-based decisions, but in reality may just make them based on politics. And each of them brings something different to the table. The academics hold the expertise for the most part. NGOs have these big scale conservation projects that could be the sort of grist for the impact evaluation mill. The investors can influence a whole bunch of people's behavior just by giving money in different ways. And the policymakers have the ability to reshape our behavior and our motivations, depending on what they decide. But there are some pretty hefty challenges to getting these groups of people to work together, which is what we're going to need to do if impact evaluation is to go mainstream. For example, um, in the academic realm, I don't need to tell you guys that professional incentives don't necessarily reward repeating someone else's experiment to build up a credible evidence base. Uh, there's a long lifetime for most social and ecological impacts, which means it's hard to do an impact evaluation as a PhD or a postdoc. You've kind of got to rely on existing data. For NGOs, um, even for an organization like WWF, impact evaluation is prohibitively expensive for most places most of the time. We have relatively limited internal expertise. We suffer from a very big fear of failure. What happens if we suddenly find that things aren't going the way we want? 
there is a real concern that donors would just walk away. Our experience has been that donors and policymakers are far more understanding than we give ourselves credit for, and that actually we're the ones with the problem, not them. Um, and our M&E systems are often driven by donor accountability, not by the desire to advance theory. Investors, even for big donors, these impact evaluations are not cheap enterprises. For most of them, they're out of their reach, particularly if you get trapped in their science budget. Their science budgets are usually small. These things are too big. And it's really difficult for investors to coordinate because they're also sort of not necessarily in competition, but they have different remits and so on and so forth. And policymakers struggle to engage in impact evaluation because the evidence is seldom in the form that they want, at the time that they want, to shape the decision that they want. That's a big problem. Policymakers make decisions now based on the information that's available to them now. If I go to them and say, well, if you give me five years and a couple of million dollars, I can get you a really good answer, they just laugh. They also have relatively limited ability to distinguish what is a credible piece of evidence. They're not scientists, they're not technical experts, they rely on people telling them. And if someone who they believe is credible is telling them this is solid, they will believe it irrespective of whether the science is good or bad. And then there's the old thing of maybe evidence doesn't really matter at all. And so one of the things that we're trying to do um, to tackle at least some of these challenges is to start picking off some of these incentives one by one. Some of this we can do by ourselves and some of this is going to require many, many different actors. But one of the ones we realized that we could do very quickly was try and have a go at this one and this one and do it all at once by writing some guidance um, on the most simple aspects of impact evaluation, framed around key points in the process. When should I use this? How do I use this? How do I design it? Who do I work with and how do I find them? How do I interpret the data that they're gonna give me and that they're gonna tell me? What do I do with it? How do I communicate it? How do I communicate the positive and the less positive? And then how do I make decisions based on evidence? These are all questions that we get asked on a regular basis. And so this consortium of organizations is trying to sort of lay a marker down and say, this is our best guess right now. So the future of impact evaluation in conservation in some ways looks really bright. We're kind of at a tipping point. Many of the big funders in this field are moving quite quickly to understanding this and to funding it and requiring it as part of their portfolio. But if we're gonna do it and do it well, we've got to not only do some science and figure out some of the methodological stuff around how do we handle different mechanisms and pathways, how do we handle interaction effects, we also have to figure out what on earth mainstream means. And if anyone has a good answer to this, please come and see me later. Um, we need to figure out how do you make evidence relevant and then think about what are the limits to evidence and what's the point at which we say this is good enough to be decisions. And then perhaps most importantly, we need to be really explicit about the biases in our evidence base. Based on the decisions that we take, what's our evidence going to tell us and what's it not going to tell us? So with that, um, I will stop and there's a whole bunch of people who do a whole lot of work on this who need to be acknowledged. Thank you.